Welcome to Class Conformity and Resistance, 1955 to 1968. This is Melinda Cole Klein. Post-war prosperity led to the development of a pervasive consumer culture. Advertising created an image of the ideal American middle-class family surrounded by the trappings of wealth. Television came to dominate the leisure hours of Americans and its programming and commercials reinforced the values of middle-class consumerism. During economic boom years of the 1950s, middle-class parents were able to provide their teens with higher weekly allowances. In addition, scholars claim 40% more teens in 1954 worked after-school jobs as compared to teens a decade earlier. This enabled young baby boomers more money to spend. This signaled a shift in buying and purchasing habits of American teens. With the availability of personal record players, millions of vinyl records sold annually. While the American Bandstand and Disney's Mickey Mouse Club produced wholesome musical formats for youth, rebellious youths preferred minority-inspired music that fueled conflict between parents and their children. The counterculture beat generation argued that it was better not to conform to the rigid standards expected by parents, the government, and the economy. Its foreign influences were Asian, heavily by non-Christian practices. This youth culture contested the status quo the expected middle-class model of conformity and sameness. These practices would, in time, create the hippie generation. This visible counterculture minority advocated extensive time and attention given to musical expression, freedom from sexual restraints, resigned alliance to rule and regulations of any kind that would limit personal experiences. This led to a youth popular movement of marginal individuals out of control of the usual society markers. This would include parents and when they fail, the police. This subculture stressed the use of drugs and sexual experiments such as multiple partners, no alliance between partners, fathers produce children but lack traditional financial obligations to offspring. Middle class cultural rebels existed in the music industry and in literature, powerful mediums, persuadable to young minds in which their lives were being redefined in regards to what was the meaning of freedom. Cultural rebels were many. They existed in print such as J.D. Salinger's Catcher in the Rye from 1946. This contradiction of American lifestyle and values became known, as mentioned, as the Beat Generation. Beats were a model of rebellious behavior to youths by the 1960s. Another significant sign of a rebellious youth culture in the 1950s was due to the popularity of music heavily influenced with black jazz in rock and roll songs. Parents cringed as their seemingly innocent children flocked to hear a young Tennessee singer named Elvis Presley with rock and roll songs, a sexy voice, gyrating hips, and other techniques borrowed from black singers making him in time the king of rock and roll. Prior to the landmark Supreme Court decision 
Brown vs. the Board of Education in 1954, American public school children attended schools based on their race. With the desire by African Americans to teach black children in a setting void of white prejudice, segregated schools became standard. For white states with black populations, separating the races fit into customary and legal practices of separate but equal, with the federal decision in Plessy v. Ferguson of 1896. But by the 1940s, in the post-war years, so much had changed, and some argued for a desegregated America. In time, the restrictive 1940s gave way to the decade of the 1950s that would bring desegregation, at least legally, to the nation's public schools by 1954. With the victory won, America began a long struggle that would offer advancement of American blacks. It would offer educational opportunities occupational ones, and open social doors for them long denied under separate but equal customs and laws. This ruling would bring confidence back to African Americans, resulting in a higher number of voting blacks and those seeking college educations. It encouraged the movement of blacks from poor southern states that restricted the pluralistic policies forced on them by Washington, D.C. So with the movement of over three million African Americans out of the South between the late 1940s and 1950s, their cultural traditions found their way into middle America. And from this, rock and roll would emerge. And as the 1940s came to an end, American prosperity continued to increase. Some scholars claim that American national wealth between 1947 and the early 1960s rose by 60 percent. Thus, American middle class families had more money to spend on entertainment and leisure activities than in the past. This, combined with suburban sprawl and a youthful baby boom population and the migration of millions of African Americans out of southern states, fueled new entertainment forms. By the 1940s, African American music infused new elements into popular music, to which rhythm and blues, R&B, would be played on records and on the radio. But in a segregated America, black-inspired music was often banned in nightclubs or by radio stations. One of the reasons why Elvis was acceptable to radio and producers was that he was white. And American critics of rock and roll printed their rejection of this music based on a variety of factors. First, as compared with music of the past, it was considered bass and ill-conceived. Secondly, its lyrics were often criticized as sexually implicit, as words carried double meanings. All the while, this emerging music genre appealed to youths rejecting the traditions of American life, such as work, parental authority, and illicit sex. As churches, schools, parents, and cities established limits in attempt to control its corrupting influences, its popularity spread. Popular singing stars at the time, such as Frank Sinatra and Nat King Cole, either condemned rock and roll or avoided it altogether. Teenagers came 
to Presley concerts in unprecedented numbers. Middle class school boards, parents, and the government considered music inspired by blacks, rhythm and blues sounds highly suggestive and tried to ban it. Influences of modern music forms and American culture from the 1920s through the 1970s. I'd like you to consider the following. The infusion of black jazz and blues sounds and lyrics by white and black artists influenced a post-World War II rebellious generation of mostly working class and middle class white American children looking for a new sound. This led to the popularity of a rockabilly star such as all that we know Elvis Presley along with others that would follow. Theater entertainments from drama to tragedies and romantic comedies became an art form from the time of the plays by William Shakespeare. Musical productions found popularity on stage and film as an outgrowth of the opera. Once television became more popular and affordable, by the 1950s musical shows competed for the latest new artist. The Beatles from Liverpool, England were first seen as a band in 1963 on The Ed Sullivan Show which began running as a Sunday night program in 1948. Ed Sullivan was in many ways progressive. He did not shy away from featuring unknown artists or black entertainers. While the Beatles became an instant hit in America, other new rock and roll groups from the UK included the Rolling Stones, naming their band after a muddy watered song, The Doors, Aretha Franklin, Elvis Presley, among others, of course, that were Americans. The gyrating hips of Elvis brought much debate over what he could do in front of the camera for millions of Americans to view. To resolve this problem, Elvis apparently was filmed from the waist up. Artists who were popular with audiences returned for additional appearances. Disney's Mickey Mouse Club enjoyed a run from 1955 to 1996, but attracted a preteen crowd along with similar clean cut lines as would Dick Clark on American Bandstand. American Bandstand hosted the memorable Dick Clark, who has just recently passed away last year, featured live acts as well on his show. This was a long running program from the early years of the 1950s to 1987 when it was complete and went off the air. While the Ed Sullivan Show ended in 1971, Clark was able to navigate the changing musical scene of the 1970s with the popularity of disco and beyond. Clark promoted in the 1950s the clean-cut American youth. Teenagers who appeared on this show stood in stark contrast to the rebellious undercurrent popularized by rock and roll artists and films such as James Dean's portrayal in Rebel Without a Cause, 1955. American Bandstand projected a wholesome image with talents such as Pat Boone, Frankie Avalon, Bobby Darin, Fabian, and Frank Sinatra. In the 1950s, this program, shown in the afternoon to fans, they watched and copied the latest fashions and hairstyles. Apparently, the rolled down socks, popular in Catholic schools, uniform dress, apparently became a national fad, 
four girls sporting them, we call them today in history Bobby Soxers. However, rock and roll, whether seen live or on television, was performed by men and boys. American females were in the audience or were dancers. They were typically the subjects of songs, but not the singers. And across the decades, there has been considerable prejudice about female guitar players once they did arrive on the scene, such as the pioneering success of folk, rock, jazz, singer-songwriter Joni Mitchell from the 1960s. While male guitar players in rock and roll bands were macho and desirable, the rightful place during the 1950s for women was as spectators and groupies. In this world, for a time, rock and roll was played by male talent. While female R&B, pop, and country stars rose to considerable fame, it would be years before we would see girl rock bands with top 10 hits. To my mind, while there might have been earlier girl rock bands, what comes to mind for me is heart. While early rock and roll crowds were attended by both boys and girls, it seems the boys wanted to sing like Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones or play the drums like Ringo Starr of the Beatles. And girls became overly emotional as musicians mesmerized them. While you might not be aware, I should mention that before the 20th century, the concept of pre-adulthood was not seen in the same way we see it now. The teenager is a modern construct. Adolescence and juvenile delinquency were teen markers that were added to the American language and dictionaries late in the 19th century. Historically, those between the ages of 13 and what we consider a little bit older were young adults, smaller in size, but adult nonetheless. This idea shifted during the industrial period. From that day until the present, we consider adolescence as a particular time in the aging process. Once it passes, this time will not return because the adult is fully grown and matured. And the term teenager would be a new word in our language after World War II. And it would be this segment of society that songwriters and producers of rock and roll would specifically market their talent and the technology that would allow these youths with money to spend to buy their records, attend concerts, and listen to songs in the privacy of their own rooms with the modern record player. To bring rock and roll mainstream, the lyrics had to be toned down. And to do this, rock and roll promoters had to acquire a reputation in which they would separate themselves from juvenile delinquents. In doing so, this would smooth the generational anxiety that drove a wedge between parents and their children. Soft rock and romantic tunes sung by Elvis helped to bridge the gap. American Bandstand helped as well to foster parents to take a second look at rock and roll music without the horrors of their memory of early rock. Rock and roll along with rhythm and blues opened economic doors for African Americans. As independent record companies they had control over the kinds of music they desired to develop and the types of artists with whom they wanted to work. 
Independent record companies hired black men and women to work in a variety of positions. From secretaries to sound men, music mixers and backup singers or instrument players. As background players, the Funk Brothers were notable. From Detroit, the best of the best were gathered in 1959 by Motown Records to become the sound behind the talent. Thus, it would be the independent labels that offered new occupations to African Americans from the late 1940s, not the major recording companies. In time, radio announcers appealed to teen listeners with do's and don'ts regarding drinking and the practice of good behavior. But besides all this rock and roll, if it could be mainstream, it had the potential to make millions of dollars for record companies if one of their artists hit it big. While independents in the early 1950s were only minor players in the record company industry, they would claim a lion's share of the profits of top singles sold by 1957. Major record companies such as RCA considered rock and roll a fad. However, the production of inexpensive singles purchased by American youths continued well into the 1960s. Radio stations were licensed for the most part by the Broadcast Music Corporation. If a station played music BMI found inappropriate, the station could lose their license. In addition, a station survived because of the amount of advertising it received. If advertising companies pulled their ads because the radio station played race music, they would go out of business overnight. So playing what was considered by many to be inferior music, this put radio stations in a precarious situation. While BMI tried desperately to retain control of the entertainment industry, the fact was rock and roll was profitable. And by the time Elvis Presley hit the airwaves, BMI could do little to stop this music outside of government laws banning it. The radio station could make or break an artist. Competition was steep and getting on the air likely involved aggressive marketing such as visiting dozens of radio stations in person. This brings us to the practice of offering gifts or monetary incentives by agents, record companies, or the artists to play a particular record. Radio station disc jockeys held considerable power, but were often poorly paid, thus easily corruptible. To save themselves from losing their license, radio stations fired hundreds of DJs as the Federal Communications Commission was cracking down on the practice of taking bribes. Record companies, past and present, suffer when their stars either land in jail or are somehow unavailable. Chuck Berry of Chess Records was at the top of his fame when he was arrested and later convicted for transporting an underage girl across state lines. In his second trial of 1962, this event landed him in jail for three years. By this time, Elvis Presley had moved on to pop, bringing him into the musical mainstream. However, similar to Chuck Berry, earlier he took a hiatus from the music industry by enlisting in the U.S. Army. As encouraged by his manager, the strategy worked and Elvis symbolized youthful patriotism. By the late 1950s, dialogues opened between the Soviet Union and the United States regarding trade and commerce. 
In this period of the late 1950s, this time was immortalized with the image of the military grandfather type portrayed by President Eisenhower. But the election of 1960 would shift this pattern. Richard Nixon was born to California working class parents who ran a grocery store in Whittier. Nixon would start at the private four-year university at Whittier College. With his BA, Nixon attended Duke University Law School before entering politics. And Richard Nixon possessed political experience early on, as many lawyers tend to do. Nixon got his political feet wet with the Alger Hess case, becoming senator in 1950 and a vice president under Eisenhower. It seemed Richard Nixon was best suited and prepared as the next president of the United States. But his time had not yet come. As the Democratic contender, John F. Kennedy took a different road to power. Born to wealth and privilege in Boston, Massachusetts, Kennedy attended private schools, then went to college at Harvard. He served in World War II in the Pacific. In the post-war years, Kennedy was elected to Congress in 1946 and 1952. Kennedy was Roman Catholic, of Irish descent, less experienced than Nixon. Until the election of JFK, the office of the president had not been filled by a Catholic. But JFK looked good on television, and he was a good speaker. This appealed to millions of voters. The historic national debate was televised to millions of viewers. More than 80 million Americans watched the debates or listened to them on the radio. Like it is today, television is a powerful political medium. The handsome, confident, well-dressed Kennedy won over American hearts in contrast to Nixon's awkwardness and stuffy appearance. While Nixon had the experience, this race for the presidency was influenced in part by the words and charming personality of JFK. The youngest president ever to be elected to this office, Kennedy at the age of 43, won the election of 1960. This started a new era in the history of America. And this presidency would see considerable challenges. After taking office in 1961, the civil rights movement heated up. There would be the Bay of Pigs debacle, while Eastern Germany, under Russian control, would build the Berlin Wall, dividing the East from the West. Sadly, this popular president was assassinated on November 22, 1963. Still today, much controversy surrounds this assassination as some consider it a result of a conspiracy targeting the president. 